little friend, and welcome to Olympia, home of the Olympic Games. We're standing in the main section of Olympia, where the Olympic Games themselves took place. Over the course of the festival, athletes competed against each other for prestige and glory to honor themselves and their cities. Enjoy your visit, friend. I'll check in when you're done to make sure you've been paying attention. The first day of the Olympic Festival began with a swearing-in ceremony for the participating athletes, trainers, and judges. The ceremony took place in front of the altar of Zeus Horkios, or Zeus of the Oath. Athletes would swear that they would follow the Olympic rules while judges promised to be fair and unbiased. Then the competitions began, starting with a contest between heralds and trumpeters over who would have the privilege of announcing the games. The first day's athletic competitions consisted of wrestling, running, and boxing events for the youngest athletes, aged 12 to 18. The second day began with a grand procession into the Hippodrome to celebrate the start of the popular equestrian events. The most anticipated and spectacular of these was the Quadriga, a four-horse chariot race. Horse racing events were unique in that the winner was not the most skilled jockey, but the owner of the fastest horse or chariot. The Spartan princess Kaniska once took advantage of this loophole to skirt the rule that women weren't allowed to compete and earned two Olympic victories in the process. The rule also allowed for occasionally strange results, like in 416 BCE, when the statesman Alcibiades entered seven chariots into a race and won first, second, and fourth place. After the equestrian competitions, the 40,000 spectators migrated to the stadium to watch the pentathlon events. When the day's events were over, funeral rites were performed for the hero Pelops, the mythical founder of the Olympic Games. The night ended with a celebratory feast and a great parade in honor of the day's victors. Victory at the Olympic Games was one of the highest honors a mortal could achieve, and there were several ways to immortalize that honor. Some athletes had statues erected of themselves, while others commissioned poets to write them victory odes. Oral tradition was very important to the Greeks. These odes, called epinikia, were often composed by the finest poets in the land, such as Pindar, Simonides, and Bacchylides. They were usually played at banquets and celebrations attended by the triumphant athlete or upon his departure from Olympia. The pentathlon took place at the stadium on the second day. As its name implies, it was made up of five events, discus throwing, javelin throwing, jumping, racing, and wrestling. There are several differences between the ancient version of events and their contemporary counterparts. For example, ancient long jumpers held weights in their hands to give them momentum to launch, since there was no run up before the jump. Similarly, if an athlete won the first three events, they were immediately declared the winner, instead of being judged by their overall performance in all five events. Running events work the same as they do today, with the notable exception of all the athletes being nude. As for wrestling, 
competitors were not divided by weight class as they are today, but instead by age. The winner was the first to throw his opponent to the ground three times. Day three started with the most important event of the festival. A procession of Helanodikai, ambassadors, competitors and animals, made their way to the great altar in front of the Temple of Zeus. The animals were then offered as the official sacrifice of the festival. The afternoon of day three was dedicated to foot racing events. Running was the oldest event of the games, and in fact was the only event at the first Olympics. The main race was called the Stadion, which was a sprint of around 180 meters. The winner was granted the honor of lending his name to the four-year period between the games. This period was known as the Olympiad. The four years that followed the first games in 776 BCE were known as the Olympiad of Coroibus of Elis, the first Olympic champion. Once all the competitions were over, a public banquet was held in the Pretineon to celebrate the day's victors. Day four was mainly for combat events. Wrestling matches were held in the morning, followed by boxing and pancration. Pancration was a no-holds-barred mix between wrestling and boxing. Almost all moves were permitted, except for biting, poking the eyes or mouth, and striking the genitals. The event was very popular, and it was seen as the ultimate expression of strength and technique. Later on in the afternoon, there was a unique racing event called the Hoplitodromos, or race in armor. In this event, competitors wore a helmet and held a shield to simulate running in the battlefield. The Hellenodikai, or judges of the Greeks, were both the game's adjudicators and their organizers. They hailed from Elis, the city in charge of the sanctuary of Olympia, and new judges were elected each Olympiad. They had several responsibilities. Before the game started, they decided which athletes would be allowed to compete and supervise their training. They also drew lots to make the competition brackets. During the games themselves, they picked the winners and kept an eye out for foul play. For the latter, they were assisted by stick and whip-wielding umpires who stood near the athletes and punished them if they were caught cheating. Victory in Olympia was one of the most prestigious honors in all of Greece. Not only would victors be showered in glory in their home city, but their names would be known across Greece. The temptation to glory led some athletes to break their oath to Zeus and cheat. This could be dangerous, as there were many possible punishments should cheaters be caught. They could be disqualified and fined, or if they were caught cheating during a match, they would be beaten by nearby umpires. The most powerful deterrent of cheating, however, was shame. At the foot of Mount Kronios and on the way to the stadium were a group of bronze statues called Zanes, the plural of Zeus. These statues were inscribed with the names of the cheating athletes, how they cheated, and the fine that was imposed. The Zanes, which were funded by cheaters' fines, were strategically placed to be highly visible. Individuals or even entire cities could be found guilty of cheating.
The Pretineion was the administrative center of the cult of Olympia and the Olympic Games. The building housed the sanctuary's priests as well as the game's officials. It was also used to stage the grand banquet held on the evening of the third day to honor victors. It also had a sacred function. Its central chamber was the location of the fire of Hestia, a sacred flame that burned day and night. This fire was used to light the other altars around the sanctuary. This practice may have partially inspired the modern tradition of carrying the Olympic torch. spectacular events and lavish banquets. The Olympic Games were a feast for the senses. I am certain even Zeus himself was entertained by the festivities. Now, is there anything else you'd like to do? Wonderful! Let the mental Olympics begin. Let's start with an easy one. Which notable woman won an event in the Games? She won two equestrian events thanks to her savvy horse purchases. This next question is slightly more challenging. Which of the following is not a famous Greek poet? You are right! Thrasidas was a renowned Spartan general, and he didn't have time for crimes and pretty words. Time for the final question. How many events were in the pentathlon? Yes, the Greek word for pende means five, and the pentathlon had five events. Well done, my friend. You truly possess a sharp mind. Thirsty for more, eh? <laughs> I don't blame you. Welcome to Athens, Wanderer. More specifically, welcome to the musical hub of the city, the Odeon. The Odeon was where musicians came to share their songs with the public. The melodies played here caught the wind and drifted through the air, soothing the souls of Athenians across the city. Come find me when your visit is complete, and we will talk about the things you've learned. See you soon, Wanderer. Music played an important part in almost every aspect of ancient Greek life. Whether attending a public gathering, rubbing elbows at a dinner party, laying out offerings in a temple, or marching into battle, there was a song for everything. Aristotle even wrote that music increased the efficiency of laborers, and it was often played for rowers and field pickers to keep them working at a steady rhythm. Musical contests, or agones, were originally only held during religious festivals. Over time, they became cultural events in their own right and attracted musicians and spectators from all over the Greek world. For example, the Athenian Panathenaea Festival featured competitions for instrument playing and poetry recitation. The Dionysia Festival included contests between groups of male singers to see who could best perform a dithyram, 
a merry hymn in honor of the god Dionysus. While these contests could be attended by all, women weren't allowed to compete in them. In the early days of the competitions, winners only received a crown and an ego boost for their talents. But from the Hellenistic period onward, the rewards were upgraded to cash prizes. These prizes were large enough for musicians to make a fortune, especially if they moved from festival to festival. The Odeon of Pericles was built sometime between the 440s and 430s BCE. The building was commissioned by Pericles for use in the Panathenaea festival. The Odeon was also a venue for poetry readings, political rallies, and philosophical performances. According to ancient sources, the original design of the Odeon was inspired by the tent of the Persian king Xerxes, a spoil of war the Athenians salvaged after their decisive victory at Salamis in 480 BCE. The building's roof was made of timber from captured Persian ships. In this sense, the Odeon was both a triumphant symbol of Athens and an insult to their Persian enemies. This structure was considered one of the grandest architectural accomplishments of ancient Athens. In ancient Greece, there was a type of music for almost any occasion. Complicated songs like hymns, paeans, and dithyrams were meant for the ears of the gods, and as such were usually played during religious ceremonies and civic life. Meanwhile, a hymenaeus was a song performed at weddings, and a threnody accompanied funeral processions. For more merry occasions like symposia, scolia were the soundtrack of choice. However, drama was considered the epitome of artistic expression, since it combined songs with poetry, dance, acting, and costumes. Plays were thought to be the connection between mortals and gods, and the songs that accompanied them, especially those from the tragedies of Euripides, often became huge hits in the rest of Greece. Hello again. I trust your visit was worthwhile, and that learning of music was a feast for your mind. I know it was for mine. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Fancy yourself an expert on music? Then let's put your knowledge to the test. Which of the following songs was played at weddings? Thrinovias were funeral dirges. They were unlikely to be played at weddings, unless the musicians had a morbid sense of humor. Try another answer. Correct. A Imeneos was performed at weddings to wish the couple a happy and prosperous union. Let's move on to the second question. The Odeon of Pericles was modeled after spoils of war from which Athenian enemy? Correct. Not only was the design based on the tent of the Persian king Xerxes, but the building's roof was made of wood from captured Persian ships. Only one question remains. According to Aristotle, music was especially important to which group of people? You are correct. Aristotle believed music improved certain motor skills, so it was played for field pickers and rowers to increase their work output. You definitely have an ear for music, Wanderer. I applaud you. That's the spirit. Follow me, Wanderer.
Welcome to Gnosis, traveler, where the Minotaur once prowled. Gnosis was the seat of the old Minoan civilization, where King Minos once supposedly ruled. These ruins have been the backdrop for many important events in both history and mythology. Look for me when your visit is over, and we'll discuss what you've seen. The island of Crete was first settled around 8000 BCE. Over time, significant towns and maritime trade began to develop. Palaces were built, destroyed, and then rebuilt, culminating in what archaeologists call the Neopalatial period, which began around 1700 BCE. This period lasted for over 300 years and is considered the golden age of Minoan civilization. The largest palace of this period was located in Knossos and featured maze-like complexes of workshops, temples, courts, throne rooms, and living areas, as well as paved roads and advanced plumbing and draining. Trade and external relations were important to the Minoans, and their networks extended across the Eastern Mediterranean. As a result, the people of Crete and the lands they traded with often influenced each other and exchanged ideas, usually through peaceful interactions instead of military conflict. The settlement of Knossos was established as early as the 7th millennium BCE. Today, one of the site's most notable landmarks is the Palace Ruins, located on the Kafala Hill. The ruins are split into two phases, the old palace, which has been poorly preserved, and the new palace. The new palace of Knossos had a surface area of approximately 13,000 square meters, making it the largest Manoan palace. Its focal point was a central court, which was probably used for ceremonial activities. The Minoan palace centers collapsed when Crete was overrun and conquered by a Mycenaean invasion from mainland Greece. However, the date of the final destruction of Knossos's palace is still unknown. During the new palace phase, the ground floor was dedicated to economic activities and contained large storage rooms. The residential quarters, which notably had toilets, were located southeast of the central court at the foot of the grand staircase. The palace was lavishly decorated with wall paintings depicting things like bull-related sports and richly dressed women. Large stone horns of consecration, which were important Minoan religious symbols, hung prominently in the west court. Other notable parts of the palace include the theatrical area, which is believed to have served as a viewing space, the tripartite shrine, which was dedicated to the worship of an important Minoan deity historians refer to as the Mother Goddess, and the Piano Nobile, a grand space located on the palace's second floor. During his trips to Crete, archaeologist Arthur John Evans discovered several ancient tablets. They eventually led him to define the forms of Minoan writing known as Linear A and Linear B. The Minoans used these forms of writing for recording many things, including business transactions. For example, one clay tablet discovered at the Palace of Knossos was inscribed in Linear B script. The tablet detailed the transfer of coriander often used in the perfume industry between a man named Kyprios and another person named Twynon. The deciphering of tablets such as these has given historians great insight 
into many aspects of Minoan culture and society. According to myth, the half-man, half-bull Minotaur was born after Queen Pacify slept with a bull sent by the gods as punishment upon her. This embarrassed King Minos, but he could not bring himself to kill the Minotaur. Instead, he hid the monster in a labyrinth constructed by Daedalus. Daedalus was an important figure in Greek mythology, an ingenious inventor. He once became so jealous of his similarly clever nephew that he threw him from the top of the Athenian Acropolis. As a consequence, Daedalus was banished from Athens, though this did not prevent him from being able to get work. In Crete, he was hired by Queen Pacify to construct an artificial cow suit that would allow her to seduce a bull she was particularly taken with due to a curse from the gods. Daedalus complied, and his invention helped facilitate the birth of the Minotaur. Afterwards, Minos conscripted Daedalus to build the labyrinth, presumably as penance for his role in creating the Minotaur. But perhaps the most well-known story about Daedalus involves his son, Icarus, who used wings built by his father and flew too close to the sun, thus plummeting into the sea. Some time after the birth of the Minotaur, King Minos's son Androgeos was killed in Athens by the same bull that impregnated his mother. An infuriated Minos demanded that Athens send seven of their noblest men and seven of their most virtuous women to Knossos every year. After being carried to Crete aboard a ship with black sails, the men and women would then be cast into the labyrinth to be eaten by the Minotaur. One of the Athenian youths chosen to be imprisoned in the labyrinth, Theseus, had enough of the morbid ritual. Before leaving Athens, he proclaimed he would kill the Minotaur, then return to his city on a ship flying white sails. Before entering the labyrinth, Theseus met King Minos's daughter, Ariadne, who fell madly in love with him. Ariadne provided Theseus with a thread he could unravel to help him find his way back out of the maze. Armed with this thread, Theseus entered the labyrinth, killed the Minotaur, escaped the maze, and set sail for Athens with Ariadne by his side. I see you found your way through the maze of ruins. The Minoans played a large part in shaping Greek myths, but also in introducing influences from other places and cultures. Now, what else would you like to do? You want to test yourself? Very well. Let's begin with a simple question. On which island was Knossos located? Yes, Knossos was located on the island of Crete. Time for another question. Which hero killed the Minotaur? Correct. Theseus slew the Minotaur, then escaped the labyrinth thanks to some thread from Ariadne. Now for the last question. What did Daedalus build for Queen Basithi? Yes, Daedalus made Pasiphae a cow suit so she could seduce the bull she was cursed to love. Congratulations, traveler. You are a true student of history. Gladly. Follow me.
Welcome, Wanderer, to one of the most prestigious places in Greece, the theater. The theater was where audiences gathered to watch plays. They were the highest form of art in Greece, and people saw theater as a symbol of complete harmony between the mortal world and the divine. When you're done taking in the sights and sounds, come see me, and we'll talk more. Until then, Wanderer. Theater is not just part of geek culture, but was a major part of Greek culture. In Athens, comedies and dramas originated from the dancing and singing performed by members of the cult of Dionysus. Between 536 and 533 BCE, theater's burgeoning importance in Athens was demonstrated when the responsibility of organizing tragedies was entrusted to the Archon, the highest ranking magistrate in the city. From then on, theater grew rapidly in popularity. And soon, a permanent space for performing and watching plays was built on the slope of the Acropolis. During the 5th century BCE, theater became intertwined with Athens' democracy. It often functioned as an echo chamber for political ideas. And in some cases, it could even influence public opinion. As a result, in the 4th century BCE, Plato coined the term theatrocracy to describe his city's politics. Theatrical competitions were held in the sanctuary of Dionysus Eleutherios, god of wine and patron of drama. Dionysus was the son of Zeus and a mortal woman named Semele. Stories say that Zeus, who had fallen in love with Semele, appeared to her holding a lightning bolt in his hand. Semele was tragically struck dead by the lightning, but Zeus managed to save her unborn child, keeping the embryo in his thigh until it fully gestated. This is why the name Dionysus is sometimes thought to mean born twice. In Athens, theater was a part of the cult of Dionysus, and stage productions in the gods' honor were held during festivals like the Linnea and the Great Dionysia. In Athens, there were three festivals that honored Dionysus with drama performances. The Rustic Dionysias, the Linnea, and the Great Dionysia. For the Rustic Dionysia, each demi of Attica organized their own Dionysiac procession. The parades were full of phallic songs, dances, and symbols meant to signify fertility. And participants wore drunkard masks and sang body lyrics about the god. The Linnea was the oldest Dionysian festival. It was exclusively reserved for Greek citizens and mostly made up of comedy performances. Finally, the Great Dionysia was the most important festival. Taking place over several days, it began with a parade called a phallophori, followed by a dithyram contest and ending with consecrated drama competitions. Dionysia was supervised by the head magistrate known as the Archon, who was assisted by 12 other magistrates. Among his duties, the Archon picked Korigoi, rich Athenian citizens responsible for providing the budget for rehearsals and performances. Two days before the Dionysia, a ceremony called the Proagon took place where playwrights introduced their work. The Dionysia finally began in earnest with a procession to the god's temple, followed by sacrifices and a symposium. 
The next two days centered on Dithiram contests, while the final four days were dedicated to drama competitions. The contest's outcomes were decided by ten judges who were appointed at random by the Archon. The judges placed their votes in an urn, and five of the votes were randomly picked to determine the winner. Athenian stage actors were male, regardless of whether they were playing men or women. Tragedies originally featured only one actor performing alongside a chorus, eventually reaching a maximum of four. Adding more roles opened up the opportunity for dramatic dialogue. During performances, they prepared themselves in the skene, a building that served as a backstage area, before emerging onto the proskenium or stage. The skene could be painted to represent backdrops like palaces, temples, and tombs. Its roof was reserved for appearances by the gods. These gods could be moved around with a crane called a makane, which produced spectacular visual effects. On stage, actors wore masks and elaborate costumes. For tragedies, they were adorned with magnificent clothes. While for comedies, actors playing male characters wore hugely exaggerated phalluses, probably to maximize the laughs. The centerpiece of the theater was the orchestra, or dancing place. It was a large, circular area that hosted choral performances, religious rites, and presumably, acting. Choruses were composed of men wearing masks and costumes. Any Athenian citizen could be choratai, as long as they were selected by the chorus director. Chorus members also served as the equivalent of a curtain, as their entrance and exit marked the beginning and end of the play. New costumes and masks were produced for the chorus for every new play, and they were often just as impressive and elaborate as the performances. For example, Aristophanes' comedies feature the chorus dressing as wasps, frogs, birds, clouds, and islands. One of his plays, The Knights, even had men riding other men dressed as horses. Athens' Theatron, or performance space, could seat up to 17,000 people, nearly a tenth of the population of Attica. Its excellent acoustics made it ideal for drama, but it was also sometimes used for political meetings and parades. The theater was accessible to everybody. This did not mean that seating was free, though. The first rows were normally where priests and public officials sat while the central part of the auditorium was reserved for ambassadors and guests of honor. There is also evidence that men and women sat separately. In general, theater audiences were emotional and noisy. During performances, they would shout, curse, and throw things depending on their mood, and their reactions were just as much a part of the experience as the acting. Hello again, Wanderer. I hope your visit was entertaining. Though all art forms were important in Greek culture, none had the same prestige as theater, which provided a unique experience with every performance. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Really? Then let's begin. Who was Dionysos' mother? Correct! Unfortunately, Semele died before her son was born, but Zeus saved the unborn baby and raised him as a god. Next, another question. Which competitions took place on the second and third days of the great Dionysia? No, the drama contests were reserved for the final four days of the festival. Try again. 
Yes, the Theorem V were hymns dedicated to Dionysos, and the Theorem Boss contests were held on the second and third days of the festival. And finally, the last question. Which of the following is the oldest festival dedicated to Dionysos? You are correct. The Linea was the oldest Dionysiac festival. Congratulations, Wanderer. You're a very studious theater goer. I appreciate your enthusiasm, Wanderer. Come with me. My friend, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Corinth's Temple of Aphrodite. In Greece, many love stories were told about the gods. How romantic! Sometimes they were heartwarming and happy, but they often ended in tears, tragedy, and a whole brood of illegitimate children. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Zeus! Anyway, this tour will introduce you to some of these divine love stories, which may give you perspective on how the Greeks approached love in their own lives. Enjoy your visit, my friend. I'll come see you again when you finish the tour. Much like Athens, Corinth had its own Acropolis, called the Acrocorinth. The natural promontory provided an excellent view of the surrounding territory. It was also the home of several sanctuaries, allegedly constructed in the 6th century BCE. The Acrocorinth's most famous attraction was the Temple of Aphrodite. Pisanius describes it as having statues of Aphrodite, her son Eros, and the sun god Helios. According to Strabo, the temple's most distinguishing feature was its servants, who acted as sacred prostitutes. However, Strabo is the only source for this information, and it is still hotly debated to this day. Love played a large role in countless mythological stories. Zeus himself was not immune to the feeling and fell for both mortals and other deities. Some myths centered on forbidden feelings that led to tragedy, such as Phaedra's love for her stepson Hippolytus. While marriage was prominent in mythology, it was usually presented as problematic. For example, Aphrodite frequently cheated on her husband Hephaestus and Medea's resentment against her ex-husband Jason eventually drove her mad enough to murder her children. These less than ideal depictions reflected the Greeks' idea of marriage, which they viewed as a civic duty instead of a romantic union. The goddess Aphrodite was one of the mightiest Olympians and was typically associated with love, beauty, and sex. She was worshipped all across the ancient Mediterranean by men and women, both young and old. Her origins differ depending on the version of the story. The poet Hesiod says that she was born from the severed genitals of Oranos, while Homer's version of the myth names her as the daughter of Zeus and Dione. Aphrodite appeared regularly in mythological stories and had many mortal lovers. Her favorite was Adonis, a beautiful boy who died tragically in a hunting accident. Aphrodite was devastated by his death, so she created a cult called the Adonia to commemorate him.
my friend! Good to see you again! I bet you were surprised by some of the stories you heard. For a bunch of immortal beings, the gods certainly were saucy, eh? Tell me if there's anything else I can do for you. Is that so, my friend? Then let's get started! Which poet said that Aphrodite was the daughter of Zeus and Vioni? Isiodos' version of this story said Aphrodite was the product of Uranos' uh, chopped olives, so to speak. So, no. Yes, it was Homer who said Aphrodite was a child of Zeus. On to the next question. Medea was married to which legendary hero? Yes, Medea was married to Iason, but after he left her for someone else, she resented him so much, she murdered their children. But let's not talk about such depressing things. Instead, you can answer this last question. What was the name of Corinth's Acropolis? No. Although now that I hear it, I must admit that Acropolint really rolls off the tongue. Correct. The Acrocorinth has been home to many sanctuaries, as well as the famous Temple of Aphrodite. You passed the test. Congratulations, my intelligent friend. I'd be happy to. Right this way. Welcome to the Silver Mines of Lavrion. The Lavrion Silver Mines were discovered between Thorikos and Cape Sunion, near Athens. They were rich in the mineral Galena and provided Athens with much of the silver necessary to mint its currency. Because of this, the mines were invaluable to the city, and the resources they provided helped turn Athens into one of the most powerful states in Greece. We will meet again after you've seen what the mines have to offer. Farewell for now, Wanderer. Silver mines were extremely rare in ancient Greece, which only increased their importance. Athens started exploiting the Lavrian silver mines at the end of the 6th century BCE and used its metal to produce its currency. Production at the mines exploded around 485 BCE when an especially rich vein was discovered. The mine's abundant silver made Athens one of the wealthiest cities in Greece. They also provided the resources necessary to build a fleet large enough to defeat the Persians at the Battle of Salamis. In short, the Lavrian mines played an integral part in the emergence of Athens as a Greek superpower. Exploiting the mines' resources required a lot of labor. To meet this requirement and save on cost, Athens leased out mining concessions to its citizens, who had their slaves to do most of the work, alongside poor day laborers. In the 5th century BCE alone, there were anywhere from 10,000 to 30,000 people toiling in the mines of Lavrion. Together, the workers managed to produce an estimated 20 tons of silver per year. Mining in Lavrion was a two-step process. First, the ore was extracted, and then it was refined. It took about 16 kilograms of raw ore 
to produce a single pure silver drachma of about four grams. Recovered artifacts from the mines provide some insight into the specifics of the mining process. Galleries were dug to follow the veins of ore. They were small and did not offer much space for the workers. They were also hand cut and it's believed that it took whole days to dig only a few centimeters. Once the galleries finally reached the veins, the ore was extracted and then crushed on mortar stone to prepare it for washing. Mine workers used washeries to help clean rock from the ore. The washing process required a large supply of water, but Lavrion was an infamously dry region. To compensate, cisterns were built in the mining area to collect and conserve seasonal rainwater. Once enough water had accumulated, workers poured it into wooden troughs containing rock and ore. The water's flow separated the lighter grains of rock from the heavier ore which was caught in depressions at the bottom of the trough. The newly cleaned ore was collected for refinement and the water was redirected back into a tank to be reused later. Once the ore was clean and dry, it was ready for smelting. Its purpose was to isolate the silver in the ore. To do this, the ore was placed in a conical furnace filled with combustible charcoal. Bellows pumped air into the furnace to control the temperature. Inside, the ore burned, emitting a toxic smoke that was evacuated through a chimney. Eventually, the silver alloy was separated from the slag and collected for the last step in the refinement process, cupellation. Cupellation removed any leftover lead from the silver. The smelted alloy was placed in a cupel, an absorbent bowl made of bone ashes. It was then put in a furnace, where it absorbed the lead and left only silver behind. While the mines of Lavrion belonged to Athens, the city frequently leased them to private citizens who exploited the site for anywhere from three to 10 years. These citizens enlisted slaves and poor day laborers to carry out most of the work. The workers had a very low life expectancy, about three to five years, due to the hazardous working conditions. The dangers they faced included toxic lead vapor in the air and lung-choking dust in the galleries. However, they were fed well enough to keep up their work, and their combined labor managed to produce an estimated 20 tons of silver a year. I hope you enjoyed your trip through the mines. We talk so much of Athens' glory, but we often forget the city's power was due to tremendous amounts of work. Work that often had a great human cost. What else would you like to do? Excellent, let's begin. What was the last step in the silver refinement process? Yes, copulation removed any remaining lead, leaving only the silver behind. Now, for the second question. How did workers acquire water for the ore washing process? Correct. The workers used cisterns to collect the seasonal rainwater. Now, the final question. Which famous battle did the mines help Athens win? 
Correct. The Athenians used silver from the mines to finance a massive fleet for the Battle of Salamis. It's clear your visit has taught you much. A job well done, Wanderer. Of course. Please follow me. Welcome to Laconia, visitor. You're here to learn about Spartan society, yes? Then I won't stop you. Sparta had a unique hierarchy, especially compared to the rest of Greece. Everyone had their place, and you will soon learn what those places were. I will find you again once your visit has ended. Until then, visitor. Spartan society was structured around austerity, self-sufficiency, and a hostility towards foreign elements. It was divided into three social classes, citizens, perioikoi, and helots. Citizens were called Spartans, or homoioi. They were free men and women with mostly equal rights and wealth, though their contributions to political life were extremely limited. The perioikoi lived in surrounding areas under Spartan control. They cultivated the land and were primarily merchants and craftsmen. They were also part of the army, and their lands were the first line of defense in the event of a hostile attack. Helots were Sparta's lowest class. They were people who had lost their freedom to the Spartans, and they served the city as slaves. Helots were considered property instead of people. As a result, they had no political or civil rights. Helots made up the majority of Sparta's population. According to Polydeuces, they lingered between slavery and freedom. Two elements made Helots differ from other slaves. They were allowed to form their own families, and they were publicly owned by the city of Sparta instead of private citizens. Because Helots were deemed public property, they could not be sold as merchandise. They mostly worked to cultivate the land, but also fought in wars alongside the Spartans. While they gave the fruits of their labor to Sparta, they also kept a fair part of it for themselves. This practice allowed some helots to make enough money to buy their own freedom. Alternatively, if a helot served the state well enough in military campaigns, they could also be granted civil rights. The founding of Sparta is dated around the 9th century BCE. Historical information about the city is limited, but it was known to extend into the region of Laconia. Over time, Sparta started encroaching on the territory of Messenia, eventually leading to war. Sparta gained more land in this conflict, which they divided between their citizens and the Perioikoi. The aftermath of the Second Mycenaean War, from 640 to 620 BCE, then divided the population into three groups, the Homoioi, the Perioikoi, and the Helots. The Helots of Laconia mostly respected Sparta's rule and did not cause much trouble. However, Helots from Mycenae supposedly resisted the Spartans, Although sources can only confirm one revolt for certain, which occurred in Messenia in 464 BCE. During the 5th century BCE, Helots were quite active in the army, especially during the Peloponnesian War. They served as hoplites on land and as rowers during naval battles. In both cases, they gave Sparta an important numerical advantage. For every Spartan on the battlefield, there were at least seven Helots. 
Although many ancient sources say Spartans had a hostile relationship with Helots, they were much more likely to treat them better in times of war. For example, when 300 Helots and 120 elite Spartans were captured by Athens during the Battle of Sphacteria in 425 BCE, the Spartans promised the Helots their freedom if they served them well in combat. Similarly, around the same time, the Spartan general Brasidas fought a battle alongside 700 Helots. Impressed by their courage and loyalty, Brasidas later freed them all and allowed them to join the Perioikoi. Perioikoi were another group of Sparta's population. They lived not in the city itself, but in its surrounding areas. The Perioikoi were never hostile against the Spartans. In fact, both groups together were known by the collective name Lacedaemonians. Perioikic cities had their own autonomy and sanctuaries, but they were always bound to Sparta. They were allowed to develop their own local laws and economies, but could never reach a level of prosperity that rivaled their parent state. I see you finished. I hope you have a better appreciation for Spartan society. Nothing we do is without a reason, and every man, woman, and child has a role to play. What would you like to do? <laughs> is that so? Then let us begin. During which battle were Elots promised their freedom? The Battle of Salamis was a glorious naval engagement where we managed to drive back a host of Persian ships. But we did not promise to free our Elots. Try a different answer. Yes. In the Battle of Stacteria, a group of elite Spartans promised to free their accompanying Elots if they helped the Spartans during a siege. Next question. Which of the following is another name for Spartan citizens? Spartan citizens were also called Omi, which meant equals. One final question. Which Spartan general freed 700 Elots? Correct. Brasidas freed 700 Elots as a reward for their exemplary military service. You passed. I'm impressed. Of course. Follow me. Greetings, visitor. You stand in Sparta's political center, where all of the city's most important decisions were made. You should feel honored. Sparta's political system was unique in the Greek world. While Athenians wasted hours on end whining and wagging their tongues at each other, Spartan kings made their decisions swiftly and deliberately. They preferred action over words. Come find me again when you finish your visit. We will speak more then. Farewell. Sparta's political system differed from most of Greece's. One of its most distinctive features was that it was ruled by two kings. These kings belonged to two separate dynasties, the Europontids and the Aegeads, both of which were said to be descended from Heracles. Both kings shared equal powers, and disputes between them required the intervention of special magistrates known as ephors. However, if one of the kings were more charismatic or experienced, they could influence the weaker king's choices.
Spartan kings had several responsibilities and functions. As lifetime magistrates, they were technically Sparta's priests and strategists, and their duties encompassed everything from politics to justice. Originally, both kings would lead military campaigns in times of war. However, from 507 BCE onwards, only one of the two kings could be head of the army. On the battlefield, kings were accompanied by 300 elite soldiers for protection. But being a king wasn't only about working and fighting, they enjoyed special privileges as well. Spartan kings lived at the expense of the city, owned royal estates in the surrounding perioikic cities, and received the majority of the spoils of war. When they passed away, they were buried with special honors, and the population mourned them for a period of 10 days. The kings of Sparta enjoyed many important religious honors. They were in charge of sacrifices, both during military campaigns and at home. The kings received double portions of the meat at all communal meals, and they were also the first to pour libations. They also personally conducted public sacrifices as priests, which helped remind their subjects of their divine connection to Heracles and Zeus. The ephors, or overseers, were five magistrates elected by the Spartan assembly. They were chosen from among Spartan citizens over 30 and served for one year with no possibility of re-election. The ephors played a large part in administrating the city and were considered the most democratic agents in the Spartan political system. They had judicial power and ordered the dispatching of the Spartan army during wars. They also met and negotiated with representatives from other states, in addition to running the agoge, the Spartan education system. While not as powerful as the two kings, the ephor still held great sway over Sparta's affairs. The Gerousia was the Spartan Council of Elders. It was made up of the two current kings, as well as 28 elders called Gerontes. They were Spartan citizens over the age of 60, the cutoff age for military duty. They were elected for life by the Spartan Assembly. The Gerousia, similar to Athens' Boule, handled legislative and financial matters. It could submit bills and motions to the Assembly and could also cancel assembly decisions with the power of veto. To ensure that the right of veto did not weaken the assembly, ephors were introduced to keep the Gerousia in check and maintain a steady balance of power. This allowed Sparta to include more just elements in its political system. The Spartan Assembly, or the Appella, was made up of Spartan citizens who were over 30 years old. Its exact meeting place remains unknown, but it was presided over by a special member of the ephors called the eponymous ephor. The Appella had limited authority, since any decision it made could be overruled by the Gerousia. But thanks to the efforts of the ephors, it still played an important role in Spartan society. The Appella dealt with topics like foreign affairs, war declarations, peace negotiations, and more. They also elected ephors and Gerousia members, 
and could both grant political rights to foreigners and remove them from Spartan citizens. Unlike the myriad sources on the functions of the Athenian assembly, the exact details of the appellate's decision-making process are unknown. I see you finished. I hope you feel more knowledgeable about the inner workings of Spartan politics. Our way of ruling was not conventional, to say the least, but it served our purpose as well. What would you like to do? Are you? We shall see. Let's begin. What was the name of the Spartan assembly? The Yerosia was the Council of Elders. Try again. No. Although Ephoros helped the assembly reach decisions. Keep trying. Correct. The Spartan assembly was known as the Appella. Question two. How many members did the Yerosia have? There were 28 Yerontes on the Council of Elders. But they weren't the only members of the Yerosia. Keep trying. Yes, the Yerosia consisted of 28 Yerondas and the two kings of Sparta. Last question. What was the name of the Spartan education program? Correct. Our rigorous education program was called the Agogi, and it was overseen by the Air Force. You've done well, Visitor. Very well. As you wish. Come with me. Welcome, Wanderer, to the democratic center of Athens, otherwise known as the Phnix. The Phnix was the meeting place of the Athenian assembly and the physical embodiment of democracy at work. This tour will give you insight into how citizens made decisions and kept the city running. We can talk more when you have finished the tour. See you soon, Wanderer. The Athenian assembly was known as the Ecclesia. It met at the Penix 40 times a year to discuss various civic matters, and each session usually lasted a few hours. The word Penix is believed to mean something close to packed together. This was probably a reference to the fact that during meetings of the Ecclesia, the location would be filled to its capacity, with citizens packed in practically shoulder to shoulder. All male citizens were allowed to directly participate in the democratic process. Those over 20 years old had the right to speak and vote, while those over 30 could be elected to the higher position of magistrate. In total, there were approximately 30,000 citizens in Athens in the classical period. To draft and adopt decrees, 6,000 of them had to attend the meeting. Citizens came from all over Attica's 10 districts to attend the meetings of the Ecclesia. The meeting was presided over by an executive council called the Pritones. Every session began with a sacrifice to Zeus Agoreos, the patron of the assembly. During the meeting, citizens delivered speeches from the Penix's platform on whatever issues the city faced. Afterwards, the issue was voted on with a show of hands from the gathered assembly. The Ecclesia made important decisions about subjects like grain importation, expenses, and declarations of war. While they could not directly enact laws, they had a say in appointing Athens legislators, which gave them a large role in shaping the city's daily operations. While some citizens only participated in the sessions of the Ecclesia, others could become more involved in democracy as magistrates. Magistrates were elected from among Athenian citizens over 30. They were often successful orators and charismatic politicians, 
and they held much more sway over important decisions than the average citizen. One of the most famous magistrates was Pericles, who was so popular, he held his position for 15 years. In theory, every Athenian citizen over the age of 20 had the right to participate in the assembly. However, some of them lived far from the city, and others could not financially afford to miss a day of work to attend meetings. For these reasons, the city introduced a special allowance called a misthos ecclesiasticos in the 4th century BCE, meant to encourage participation. Originally, it was two obols, but the politician Cleon raised it to three. Athens introduced several innovations that heavily influenced modern society, including theater, architecture, and philosophy. However, their greatest contribution was their democratic government, which introduced the concept of a city ruled by its citizens. The decision to adopt democracy as a government, a choice made in 508 BCE, shaped civilization as we know it and continues to affect us today. Hello again, Wanderer. I trust you appreciated learning about the inner workings of the city. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Then let's start with a simple question. Approximately how many citizens were in Athens in my time? Yes, there were approximately 30,000 citizens in Athens, although the population as a whole was much larger. On to the second question. Who of the following was a famous Athenian magistrate? Yes, Pericles was an extremely popular magistrate who managed to keep his position for 15 years. Only one question left. What does the word Penix mean? Correct, the Penix was usually crowded with citizens attending meetings of the Ecclesia. You know enough about democracy to be a politician yourself. Well done, Wanderer. It would be my pleasure to take you to your next destination. Follow me. Welcome to the Gymnasium of the Kinosaries, one of the many places where philosophers came to enrich the mind and enlighten the spirit. Education held a very important place in Greek society. The most prominent educators were philosophers, whose teachings ranged from everyday rituals to the makeup of the universe. Once your tour is complete, come find me, and we can discuss what you've learned. Farewell for now, Wanderer. Philosophy comes from the Greek word philosophia, or love of wisdom. This concept was in direct contrast with philochromatia, love of money, and philotemia, love of honor. As of the second half of the 5th century BCE, Athens was known as Greece's capital of philosophy. Due to the rise of democracy, there was an increasing need for education beyond the basic subjects of elementary school. Athenian citizens needed to be able to participate in various functions of the democratic state, such as being elected for office, proposing new laws, engaging in military decisions, or simply defending their rights.
Originally, Athens had no official school buildings for higher education. Sophists and philosophers taught either in private homes or in public spaces like the theater. To recruit young pupils for long-term curricula, they also held classes in Gymnasia, where young Athenians underwent physical training. The Sinosarges was a sanctuary to Heracles, located in the south suburb of Athens. At the beginning of the 4th century BCE, Antisthenes used this sanctuary as a teaching spot for his school of philosophy, the aptly named Cynicism. Any free citizen was allowed to involve themselves in the Athenian democratic process. However, to truly influence the flow of politics, their speech and rhetoric skills had to be impeccable. As a result, many sophists taught subjects like logic, reason, and eloquence. These were meant to help students achieve arete, or excellence. But this specific concept of excellence was often challenged, especially by other philosophers. For example, Plato, Socrates, and Isocrates preferred a more moral approach and argued that rhetoric should be used as a means to serve the greater good. Socrates and Plato went even further, declaring that philosophy and wisdom were not only useful tools, but also ethical virtues. Ancient Greek philosophy was multidisciplinary in nature. In addition to wisdom and logic, philosophers also studied and taught math, geometry, music theory, and even medicine. For example, the philosopher Prodicus wrote a treatise called On Human Nature, where he outlined various explanations on human physiology. Philosophy's influence was also great enough to affect medicine. Hippocratic physicians were known to incorporate philosophical ideas into their work, and the treatise on airs seems to be influenced by pre-Socratic theories on air being the first principle of the universe. The famed philosopher Socrates had an ambiguous relationship with sophists. In Plato's dialogues, Socrates is portrayed as being in constant opposition with the famous sophists of his time. Aristophanes' comedy, The Clouds, meanwhile, depicts Socrates as a sophist himself, constantly demanding payment for his teachings. Socrates was in fact very poor and made no money off his teachings. He also differed from the sophists in that while they only taught aristocratic youths, Socrates taught everyone, regardless of station. And fortunately, his controversial ideas and practices did not sit well with the city of Athens, and he was eventually tried for impiety. Philosophy was not only a collection of ideas, but a way of life. According to philosopher Pierre Hadot, his ancient counterparts had a daily regime of spiritual exercises to combat their passions, doubts, and illusory beliefs. These exercises included meditation on death, contemplation of nature, or speaking with a friend or mentor. Philosophers also followed specific dress codes and diets. They were also part of a community of masters and students. These communities were created and strengthened in schools. Plato founded such a school in the early 4th century BCE, when he purchased a property in a grove just outside of Athens. The school was designed to groom students into philosopher citizens, who could eventually rule the city in a measured and fair manner. It followed its own rules and was open to both male and female disciples. I can tell by the crease in your brow that you're already puzzling over the new things you've learned. Don't be embarrassed. Even the wisest among us need to ask questions before they search for answers. Is there anything else you'd like to do? You wish to test your wisdom? Very well. 
Let's see how you compare to the great philosophers. The first question is an easy one. What does philosophia mean? Correct. Philosophia referred to the love of wisdom. Time for the next question. The Kinosaries was a sanctuary dedicated to which Greek hero? Correct. It was the mighty Heracles. Now for the last question. Which play by Aristophanes portrayed Socrates as a sophist? Yes, The Clouds was a comedy that portrayed the famous philosopher as a greedy sophist. Plato even believed that this caricature contributed to his mentor's eventual trial and execution. Well done, Wanderer. Even Socrates would be impressed by the depths of your wisdom. Very well, I'll take you there. Follow me. Greetings, my friend. Welcome to Arcadia, home of shepherds, sheep, and sh uh, manure. Arcadia was well known for its sublime natural vistas. Farmers and shepherds were seduced by its beauty, and it's easy to see why. I have to leave for now, but I'll meet you again when you finish your visit. Until then, my friend. Grain was a staple of the Greek diet, to the point where Homer referred to his compatriots as mortal eaters of bread. Grain farming was a meticulous process. Due to dry summers, artificial irrigation was impossible, so farmers had to rely on rainfall to water their crops. This gave them very narrow windows for sowing and harvesting. On a farm of this size, only half of the field would be planted every year, while the other half would lie fallow to avoid exhausting the soil. According to the poet Hesiod, the best time to sow grain was in autumn, and the best time to harvest it was in May. Fortunately, if farmers missed their opportunity, they also had a chance to plant millet in the spring. Before planting in a field, the land needed to be plowed a total of three times once in the spring to remove weeds, again in the summer to aerate the soil, and a final time in the winter to plant the seeds in the moist earth. The plow was pulled by two oxen, while the sowing of seeds was done by hand. After the seeds were planted, a boy turned the soil with a hoe to protect them from hungry birds. Once the sowing was finished, the farmers waited for winter rains to irrigate the field. They also prayed to the goddess of agriculture, Demeter, and her daughter, Persephone, in the hopes of being favored with a bountiful harvest come springtime. Grain was harvested in the spring using a curved knife called a sickle. With their backs to the wind, the reapers cut the plant stalks and left the sheaves behind before moving through the rest of the crop. Once the harvest was mowed, the sheaves were brought to the threshing floor. Animal husbandry was an important part of Greek agriculture. Farmers usually kept cattle, donkeys, sheep, goats, pigs, dogs, geese, 
and chickens. The animals mostly fed in pastures, but could also eat some of the farm's harvested grain, as well as damaged fruit and residue from olive oil and wine production. Livestock had several purposes. Their manure was used to fertilize the fields, and their grazing helped remove weeds. Arcadia was a mountainous region believed to be the home of the god Pan, so farmers were more likely to keep sheep and goats than cattle. Most farming tools were simple, handmade implements made of wood and occasionally tipped with iron. The most complicated tool was the plow, which was made up of several parts, including a beam, a drawbar, and a yoke. A two-pronged hoe, meanwhile, was used for tilling soil, and farmers also had tools for digging and weeding. After the sheaves were harvested, workers brought them to the threshing floor to extract the grain. Oxen or donkeys were hitched to a post in the center of the floor and guided around it, while workers threw sheaves under their hooves. The animals stomping forced the grain kernels out of their casings. Afterwards, the kernels were collected for the winnowing process. Winnowing helped separate the heavier grain seeds from the chaff. It began with using a wooden shovel to toss the grain. While in the air, the wind blew away the lighter chaff, leaving only the heavier grain. To remove the remaining chaff, the grain was tossed in a wooden basket called a lignon, which filtered the grain until only clean kernels remained. Barley which was used to make flour, was different from other types of grain. Threshing was not enough to separate the barley from its husk. So instead, it was roasted in a specialized tool called a frigatron. After the barley was roasted, it was pounded with a mortar and pestle. The pounded grain was then ground into a meal using either a hand mill or a hopper mill. Grinding was boring work. So workers often lightened the mood with a mill song. Once the barley was completely ground, it was sieved using a wicker basket called a koskinon, making it ready for use. Grain storage areas needed to be dark, dry, cool, contained, and well ventilated to prevent the grain from spoiling. According to Hesiod, the preferred method of storing grain was in a pithos, the same container as Pandora's mythological box. Archaeological evidence suggests that Greeks may have also stored grain in small, walled structures woven from branches. Farms generally needed to store enough grain to sustain themselves for the year and seed corn for the next. Any surplus was either stored for a lean year or sold to markets for profit. My friend, good to see you again. You must feel hungry. I know I would, spending all that time watching farmers working themselves to the bone. Now, what else can I do for you? If you say so, let's get started. According to Isiodos, what was the best month to start harvesting grain? Yes, spring was the ideal time for harvesting. Guess I'm not the only smart one around here. Time for another question. Which tool did reapers use to cut stocks? Yes, a sickle was a curved knife, making it ideal for harvesting sheaves of grain. Only one question left. Arcadia was believed to be the home of which god? Correct. Pan supposedly called the mountainous region his home. Incredible work, my friend. It's safe to say your mind is definitely more wheat than chaff. Of course. Just follow me and we'll be there in no time.
Hello, Wanderer. May I introduce you to the Keramikos, the kiln that warms all of Athens' pottery. The Keramikos was a special neighborhood in Athens, where potters created vases and containers that stood all over Greece. This tour will take you through the elaborate process needed to turn something as simple as muddy clay into ornate perfume vases and gilded wine cups. Come find me when you complete your visit, and we can talk more about what you've learned. The Keramikus was a large, sprawling area northwest of Athens' Acropolis. While part of it was used as a graveyard, it was also dedicated to the creation of pottery. The Keramikus was so significant to the art form that its name lives on in the word ceramics. Perhaps drawn by the river, potters moved into the area and formed their own bustling community. It's believed that by the end of the 5th century BCE, Hundreds of thousands of pottery vessels had been made in Athens, including everything from heavy, undecorated cooking pots to delicate and beautiful containers reserved for the most precious oils. Sadly, only around 1% of these works survive today, some only in small fragments. Raw clay from a river was hardly fit for a potter's wheel. Athenian potters used clay that was rich in iron, which created the distinctive orange-red coloring seen in Athenian pottery. But this high-quality clay needed to be handled carefully to avoid disasters in the kiln later on. The clay was first brought to settling beds, where it was mixed with water to wash out any organic debris like leaves. Once it was purified, Workers kneaded the clay with their hands to push out air bubbles and create the texture necessary for a flawless finish. One of the goals of these early steps was to remove any impurities that could destroy a delicate design, or worse, render a vase unusable. Once the clay was cleaned, it was up to the potter to shape it into a vase by spinning it on a wheel or pressing it into a mold. Their choice depended on what shape they wanted for the vase, but they also considered the possible scope of its decoration. Potters did not work alone. A workshop might have had many people working together on different aspects of production. Potters collaborated with many different painters for decorating their creations. Some of these painters even became potters themselves. All in all, a single vase could be worked on by many different artists, with each one focusing on a different aspect of its design. After the pots were shaped and decorated, they were packed into kilns for the lengthy and delicate firing process. The process had three stages, oxidation, reduction, and reoxidation. The main purpose of the firing process was to carefully manage the clay's exposure to oxygen. The chemical reactions caused by firing gave the pots their distinctive orange-red coloring. 
This also turned the designs made from the clay decoration slips glossy and black. The most difficult part of the firing process was managing the fires themselves. It required an enormous amount of skill and experience to properly judge the exact temperatures needed, and even the smallest mistake could ruin several hours of work. Vases could be decorated in all sorts of ways. Before 530 BCE, Athenian vases were decorated using the black figure technique, where figures and designs were painted as dark silhouettes. At the end of the 6th century BCE, painters created a new technique called red figure, an inversion of the painting process that left the figures in red and the background in black. This gave the artist more freedom to better explore details like muscles and individual locks of hair. Designs were sketched onto the bare surface of the pot using a thin, sharp tool. Thin relief lines, which helped define subtle elements like facial features, were added using a brush made of a few stiff hairs. More elaborate vases were sometimes gilded, but these decorations were so delicate, they were most likely only added after the firing process. You've returned! As you can see, pottery was an arduous and delicate process, but was exemplary of the skill and craftsmanship that dominated Greek art and culture. Now, is there something else you'd like to do? Then let's get right to it, starting with an easy question. What was responsible for the orange-red color of most Athenian vases? Organic debris like leaves were actually filtered out of the clay early on in the process. Keep trying. Correct! Athelian potters worked with clay that was rich with iron, and that iron created a distinctive orange-red coloring. On to the next question. What were the chambers for firing pottery called? Correct! Pottery was fired in kilns, and the firing process was extremely precise and delicate in nature. You're almost done. Just one more question. The firing process was made up of how many stages? The firing process was not made up of five stages. Keep trying. Correct. The three stages of the firing process were oxidation, reduction, and re-oxidation. You know your pottery. Well done, Wanderer. It would be my pleasure. Follow me. Hello, my friend. Welcome to Kithira, where clothes are dyed and noses are assaulted by disgusting smells. This little island was where dyers brought all the color to Greek fashion through an intensely stinky procedure. This tour will reveal the steps it took for workers to brew the dye. Try not to step in any mollusk guts as you enjoy your visit. I promise I'll meet you at the end of your tour. See you soon, my friend! In Greece, Fabric and clothing were colored using natural dyes from shellfish, insects, and plants. Skilled craftsmen across the Greek world extracted dyes from these sources and combined them with other substances to create a variety of colors. The dyeing process supposedly produced incredibly pungent smells, and ancient writers would often comment on the stink in their works. Murex is the generic name for three species of mollusks that reside in the Mediterranean. The substance they secrete was used by craftsmen to create the most expensive dyes in the ancient world, the most famous of which was Tyrian purple. 
fishing techniques varied depending on the type of mollusk. In shallow waters, fishermen could simply dive and catch the mollusks, but they set traps if the water was too deep. Being carnivorous, murex were often lured using dead animal flesh as bait. It was imperative that the mollusks be captured alive, as they only secreted the precious purple liquid needed for dyes upon death. The purple liquid that made up most dyes came from a gland in the murex. To collect it, workers would either crack open the mollusk's shell with a knife, or if it was smaller, crush it with a stone. Each mollusk only produced a small amount of liquid, and thousands of them were needed to produce even a gram of the substance. Because of this, captured mollusks were usually kept alive in seawater immersed baskets until enough had accumulated to produce a satisfactory amount of dye. The mollusk glands were mixed with salt and left to decompose for three days. Afterwards, the resulting mash was placed in a vat where it boiled until it was thickened and reduced to one sixteenth of its original volume. The dyers stirred this mixture and removed any impurities. This process produced the foul odor so reviled by ancient writers. Dyers checked the hue of the purple liquid by dipping in raw wool. The hue could be changed by adjusting the temperature of the liquid and by soaking the wool for different periods of time, with longer soaking producing deeper shades. The wool was dyed once before spinning and again before weaving to ensure it maintained its color. While Murex purple dyed wool easily, it did not adhere as well to other fabrics such as linen. Most Greek garments were made from rectangular fabric that was rarely cut or sewn. They were normally folded around the body with girdles, pins and buttons. Dyeing served to give the garments a more unique style. Decorations were also widely used and were either woven or painted on. They depicted things like animals, human figures, and mythological scenes. <laughs> Textile manufacturing and trade was one of the most lucrative businesses in classical Athens. Textiles were made of either wool or linen, with wool being the most common. Women produced the garments worn in domestic life, although some men ran professional workshops that fulfilled the same need. Other textiles were made by slaves and laborers under the supervision of master weavers, fullers, and dyers. Clothes didn't just keep people warm. They were used as a way to communicate social identities like gender, status, and ethnicity. These could be expressed through garments and accessories, but also jewelry, hairstyles, perfumes, and cosmetics. Wealthy Greeks usually had garments of the highest quality, and all their accessories were decorated with gold, silver, or gemstones. Parasols and fans were also an important part of elite fashion, and were usually carried by accompanying slaves. The most common Greek garments were the peplos, the keton, and the hymation. The peplos, typically worn by women, was a body-length cloth. It was folded back on itself and worn draped over the body and pinned over the shoulders. The keton was a long garment with sleeves. Ankle-length ketones were normally worn by women, 
while men wore shorter versions of the garment. A hymation was a mantle that was worn over both the keton and the peplos. Outside of daily life, there were also specialized clothes worn only in exceptional situations like weddings and religious ceremonies. Good to see you again, my friend. I bet your clothes feel heavier now that you know how many mollusks were killed to dye them. But let's change the subject, yes? What else can I do for you? Then let's get right into it, starting with this question. Which purple dye was the most famous? I'm not uh, familiar with that specific shade. Sounds like something the Spartans would like. Try another answer. Yes. The purple created from murex secretions was one of the most expensive and well-known dyes in the world. Here's another question. How did workers check the dye's hue? No, unless they wanted burn purple toes. <laughs> Try another answer. Correct. Workers dip wool into the mixture to gauge the exact hue of the dye. Almost done, my friend. Just one final question. Which body length garment was typically worn by women? A himation was a mantle worn over other types of clothing. Try again. Correct! A peplos was a body-length cloth that a woman draped over her body and pinned around her shoulders. I had no idea you were so knowledgeable about fashion, but look at you! I should have known from what you're wearing! There is nothing I'd rather do! Follow me! Amazing! You have now completed all available guided tours. Congratulations on your achievement and dedication to knowledge. We hope you have enjoyed your explorations into the rich history of ancient Greece. Even though you've done all the tours, there's still plenty left to see. There are hundreds of world stations to explore, mountains to climb, seas to swim, and sunsets to watch. Remember that you're welcome to return to guided tours at any time and replay your favorite ones. On behalf of the Assassin's Creed team, thanks for playing the Discovery Tour, and we hope to see you again soon.